Hey guys, welcome back to the image processing series. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at convolution. And I'll have a couple more videos on convolution in the future, but in this one, we're just going to look at the most basic form of convolution. So just the standard algorithm for performing convolution on images. So let's get right on into that. So let's actually take a look at what is convolution. I have this PowerPoint here that I found for free online. It's uh, from the stanford.edu website and it's by this professor named Siddhartha. I'll link this into, in the description. I'm just going to use it for some explanations because it has some good visuals down here. So what I actually want to focus on is this discrete convolution because that's what we're going to do. Um, there's a continuous form of convolution that uses integrals, but uh, we're working with pixels and images, so we only care about discrete values, so we're only going to take a look at that. And if you take a look over at the right here, you can see the math formula for convolution here. Um, seems a little complicated, but we'll get down to explaining that in a minute here. So basically what that amounts to is you have arrays of values. One of them is the image, the other is the kernel. So this first one here co corresponds to f in the function, and the second one here is a kernel, and that's going to correspond to g. So what we do to calculate the convolution of g on f, uh, we will take this kernel, kind of superimpose it over the image, and multiply the value in the kernel by each value it's over in the image, and sum all those together, and then we write that to the corresponding pixel that the kernel is centered over. So we do that for each and every pixel. So here we, you see we did the first pixel, then we go on to the second pixel, we do the same thing, multiply the kernel values by the image values, and then write that to a new image. And we do that for each and every value here. And after we do that, we eventually get down to where we have written all the values over. And once we have this new image data here, we just end up writing that back into the image. So that's going to replace the image there. And so you might be saying, well, who cares? Well, you can actually use convolution to do all sorts of stuff. So you can apply filters to your image, such as this blur here. You can do this edge detection and this emboss, which kind of sharpens all the edges there. So it's actually really useful in image processing, and it's useful to be able to do this fast. So here's a formula again. It might be beneficial to pause the video and see if you can figure out which parts of this formula correspond to which part of the convolution algorithm I just described. One thing I will mention about this formula though is the M and N there are actually the row and column we're writing to in the resulting image. And that actually depends on what we choose the center of the kernel to be. So in this example here, the center is 1, 1, the actual center of the kernel if we use zero indexing, but we might want to choose a different coordinate to be the center and we'll actually take that into account in our code. The other thing you might be wondering is what the heck do we do with these edge cases that stick over here? And there's actually a couple different ways you can deal with those. We're going to go over a couple of them in this video, uh, but the first one we're going to take a look at is where we just consider the image underneath those overhangs to be zero. So basically anything that's in the kernel there is going to get multiplied by zero and it's going to get canceled out of our sum. All right. So with that, let's head back over to Sublime and we can go ahead and start the declaration for this convolution function. And I'm just going to call it STD convolve clamp to zero. And that just has to do with the fact that uh, we're making the edges there that stick over um, zeros. And that's going to take in a channel because we can only perform it on one channel, a kernel width, a kernel height, and an actual kernel. And on top of that, we're going to take in this CR and CC, which are actually going to be the coordinates of the kernel center, which I talked about before. So basically, when we're computing the pixel in the nth row and nth column of our new image, um, the kernel element at these coordinates will be centered over that pixel. All right, so we can go ahead and copy that and go into the CPP to start the definition. And the first thing we actually want to do here is to find a new array to hold all the image data that comes from the sum. And the reason for this is 
if we wrote the sum into the image right after we did it, then in the next pixel, the kernel might overlap with that previous pixel and it will take the overwritten value rather than the original value. And we actually don't want that. So what we have to do is write all the summed values into a new array. So that's what I'm just creating here. The next thing I'm doing right here is just making this center variable to hold the center index of the kernel. And that's just helpful a little bit later. And after we do that, we want to start our first loop, which is where we loop through all of the pixels, because remember, we have to center the kernel on each and every pixel. So that's kind of what this is doing. And the reason I'm starting at channel here is because we're only applying it to a single channel. And then we can define this double C that's going to hold the sum. So that's going to hold the sum after we multiply each kernel value by the pixel value it's over. And then the next thing we want to do here is actually loop through the kernel because we have to take each value in the kernel and multiply it by the value of the pixel that's under it. To do this, I'm going to start looping with i at negative cr and loop until i reaches the height of the kernel minus cr. And my reasoning for this is I'm going to consider the center of the kernel to actually be 0, 0. And any pixel above it is going to have a negative i value, and any pixel below it will have a positive i value. And that just helps later on when we do the multiplication part. And inside this loop here, I'm actually going to define this long called row. Remember, we're looping over the kernel right now. So it's useful to know which element of the kernel is over which pixel in the image. So what row is going to hold is the row in the image that the current kernel element is over. So to define row in that way, we can take k divided by channels, which is the current pixel, and then divide that by the width, and that will give us the current row. And then we can subtract i. And the reason we subtract i instead of add is because the formula for convolution flips the kernel on both axes. So basically, the rightmost pixel actually becomes the leftmost pixel when we go to do the convolution. The bottommost pixel becomes a top, and so forth with all those. And then once we get that row, we want to check to see if the row is less than zero, because then it is hanging over the edge. And same if the row is greater than height minus one, because then it's also hanging over the bottom. And, and if that's the case, we can just continue. And since the inner loop is just going to be the same thing, but along the horizontal axis, we can just go ahead and copy the loop before, change i to j, cr to cc, kernel height to kernel width, and row to call, and of course height to width. And that should work for that axis as well. So if we don't end up skipping this iteration of the loop, then we know that the current kernel element we're on is over a value in the image. And we want to actually compute the product of the kernel element and the pixel it's over, and then add that into the sum. So to do that, we want to multiply the value at the current kernel element by the pixel data it's over in the image. So to get the current kernel element, we can take center and add this offset, which the offset is computed by multiplying i by the kernel width and then adding j. And then to get the corresponding pixel in data, we want to take a row times the width and then add the column. That gets the pixel. And then we multiply by the number of channels and add channels so we make sure we're in the right channel. Once we finish both of those loops, we know we've looped through the entire kernel, multiplied every kernel element by the pixel value below it, and summed it into C. So what we can do now is in the very outermost loop, just set new data at k divided by channels to the value at C. But new data is a uint8 array, so we have to cast it, bound it, and round it. The only thing we need to do at the end here is just set our old data to the new data. So we're gonna loop through data and just set the kth value of data to the corresponding value in new data.
And with that, that function is done. So we can hop over to main and try to test it. Okay, so down here, I have some kernels already typed out. Uh, so we can go ahead and copy these up to the top. As you can see, one of them is what's called an embossing kernel. The other one's a Gaussian blur. I think first I want to use the Gaussian blur. So let me comment out the emboss kernel and uncomment the Gaussian blur. And what I'm going to do here is just on test, I'm going to call this function that we just wrote. So std convolve clamp to zero. And if you remember, that takes the channel we're going to act on. And I'm actually going to apply this to every channel. So the first parameter is going to be the channel. The second one is going to be the kernel width, I believe, and then the kernel height and the actual kernel. So we're going to pass cur there. And then after that, it's the center. So since this is a three by three and I want the center to be the very middle one, I pass one and one. And then I'm going to go ahead and change the channels to be unique here. And that's pretty much it for the convolution. So we can go ahead and write this to a output image. I'm going to write it to this image called blurred right here. And then we can go ahead and try to make and run this. Looks like we have a little error here. Ah, okay. So looks like I accidentally put the array brackets next to the type instead of the variable. So let me just fix that. So if we recompile here, looks like we get that blurred.png written to a file. So let's go ahead and open the original file here so we can compare. As you can see, the blurred picture is a blurred version of the original image. So it looks like our function worked. Uh, but there's actually a couple other ways we can handle these border cases. So the other way we can do that is instead of setting the overhang parts to zero, we can set the overhanging part to be the nearest border pixel. So for example, that top middle pixel there, the nearest border is that two in the image. So we'd, instead of multiplying that kernel element by zero, we'd multiply it by two. And to do that, we can make a new function. And this one will be called clamp to border instead of clamp to zero. It'll take all the same arguments. And we can actually go over to image.cpp and just copy this entire function because we're only really changing one part of it. And that part is the name of the function, obviously, and this logic inside the for loops where we set the row. So instead of just continuing and ignoring this case, we want to actually multiply it by the nearest border pixel in the image. So if the row is less than zero, then we're just going to set row equal to zero. And then if the row is greater than height minus one, then we actually want to set the row to height minus one. So it's kind of like rounding down to the border or rounding up to the border, whichever case it happens to be. And the same sort of thing happens for the columns as well. So I'm just going to copy this and replace row with call and height with width. And with that, that version of the function is done. So we can come back over here and let's actually make another image object so that we can compare these two. So let me just set this thing up really quick. So as you can see, we're going to have this T0 where we do all the clamp to zero convolutions. And then we're going to have T1 where we do the clamp to border convolutions. So let me just change all that. And we'll write this image to blurred one so we can have two different images. Let's run that. As you can see, the um, other image got made. And it might be kind of hard to tell the difference here because the only difference occurs at the very edge of the image. So what we can actually do is hop back over to main here and we can use the diff map function we made in the last video. So we can create this new image diff and we can set it equal to either of the images and then we'll just use that diff map function to compare the two images. And we can write that diff image to diff.png. There we go, that ran. 
And if we open both these images and open diff, you can maybe see around the border here, there's some coloration, uh, but that could be pretty hard to see. So let's use that diff map scale function we also made in the last video and let's, let's try that out. There we go. So now it's pretty obvious the difference is around the border there. So now that that's working, let's go ahead and look at another way we can deal with these edges here. And that's where instead of clamping the border, instead of clamping to zero, we can actually wrap around to the other side of the image. So if it sticks over one edge, it's going to wrap around to the other side of the image. And if we head back over to Sublime here, we can go ahead and define a new function. Again, we can just copy this. And I'm actually going to call this one cyclic since we will be wrapping the kernel around the image. All right. So if we head back over to the CPP here, we can go ahead and copy this second function since it's going to be very similar yet again. And we can go ahead, come down here, change the name of the function to cyclic. And again, the only thing that's going to change here is going to be in these if statements. So in this very first if statement here, if row is less than zero, then we actually want to wrap it around to the other side of the image, so the bottom side. So to do that, we can take it modulo the height and then add height because when you do modulo with integers, it actually will leave it negative if it's negative. So we just got to add h there. And if it's greater than h minus 1, we can actually just take that modulo h. That way, if it goes over the edge, it'll go back down to the top of the image. And same sort of thing with call here, except I'm just going to replace row with call and height with width. It's the exact same principle. So after we do that, we are already done with this function. And we can go ahead and head back over to main. And let's test this out here. So I think I will actually make a new image here so we can compare all three of them. So let's call this one T2. And it's going to be another copy of test. We can go ahead and copy basically the same exact code here. I'm going to change this to T2 and we're going to change this to cyclic and we'll call the resulting image blurred2. So instead of comparing T0 to T1, let's compare it to T2 and then we can go ahead and run this. Looks like I forgot a semicolon up here. Whoops. All right, let's try running that again. There we go. So it looks like we wrote all three of those image and let's go ahead and take a look. So here's the third blurred image. This is using cyclic and then compared to the first one, kind of hard to see, but let's take a look at the diff map. As you can see around the edge, that's the only difference. So it looked like that one worked as well. And let's actually compare this to T1 as well, just so we can see what it looks like here. That worked as well. Let's go ahead and look here. There's two images. There's a difference. As you can see, similar thing, maybe a little bit different. Um, and maybe the last thing we'll do here is instead of using the Gaussian blur, we'll try out the uh, emboss kernel. So let's comment out the Gaussian blur and use the embossing kernel instead. And you guys can just look up these kernels. Just make sure when you enter in the numbers that all of them sum up to one, basically their magnitudes. All right, so let's go ahead and run that and we can take a look at these images see it does a little bit different thing here and since we applied it to each channel it looks kind of weird but that is the desired result and as you can see around the edge again that's the only difference so that is basically it for this video guys thank you so much for watching i hope to catch you in the next video where we're going to be trying to figure out a faster way to do this convolution because there is actually a faster way we can do this so hope to see you guys then